third episode. It is about women, and it is titled Miss Bauhaus. We are Lenore, Lily, Bruno, Patty, Nora, Kaya, and Mia. Yeah, so we're the youngest Bauhaus. Basically, we're a youth group of interested artists, young artists. And specifically, we focus on little aspects of Bauhaus that don't get a lot of attention. So today, we're going to be focusing, as Lily said, on women at the Bauhaus. So all the female artists and really what they contributed and what they brought to the table. Also how progressive the school was, because um, it, it was a very progressive school. It was one of the first art schools that kind of tapped into uh, modern, contemporary art, kind of. Definitely, and that's a really important thing that we want to mention before we get into this topic, is that... Um, you criticize the ones you love most and everything that we say in this podcast is not to negatively impact um, the image of the Bauhaus movement and the school of Bauhaus but just to shine a light on our view as um, citizens of the 21st century and how we feel about this but also keeping in mind the context of the time so this was in the early 1900s around I mean the Bauhaus started in 1919 and In that same time, women were given suffrage in Germany. So now women could vote, and this was really crucial. Um, And then when Gropius opens his school, one of the first statements he makes is that regardless of your gender, you will be accepted into the school if you meet the criteria. But I think one of the roadblocks in that would be that women were generally not allowed in the art education system. So if they wanted to learn about art, if they wanted to learn fine arts, they had to go and pay private lessons to do so which is obviously more expensive so that also you know is quite classic so in the first semester the first term Bauer started there was actually more women than men starting at the Bauer school I mean over the years it kind of progressed into a more male dominated space then he was also kind of in a battle between like finances and also the reputation of Bauhaus the 1920s weren't a super progressive time as we have them now, where they didn't have like a image of women being successful mm-hmm. as artists and then kind of also having to deliver mm-hmm. lots of art. The title of this episode is Mrs. Bauhaus. And the reason we did that is because Vita Gropius, um, his wife uh, inspired him so much and gave him mm-hmm. so many ideas and mm-hmm. contributed so much to the Bauhaus as we know it today and as it was known back then. Yet nobody knows her. Yeah, we don't hear about her. We just hear <laughs> about she... Vita Gropius. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you hear about Vita Gropius. And yeah. it's, like all the time. It's crazy. But he, his yeah. ideas were his ideas, but a lot of them came from her, and she got no recognition. But yeah. she was known just at like the Lucia, Bauhaus yeah. as Mrs. Bauhaus. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Behind every great wo- uh, man, there's an even greater woman. I mean, that's why when we were researching like uh, women in leading positions at the Bauhaus, initially I went in and I was like, oh, we're going to find out loads, like all these women. And there were a lot of women who had important roles, but they were... (laughs) 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 Um, But they were never, like, quite on the same level as the men. And I have to say I was kind of disappointed. I I mean, I don't know, I'd kind of had hope. Female artists didn't generally feel encouraged to take Mm. part in, in, you know, the the metal... um, Woodworks. Workshops. So anything to do with like metal, wood, different things. Like there was those were seen as the the manly mm-hmm. masculine disciplines. Whereas women were um definitely encouraged and pushed to do more of the Bereis, so working with um wool and textiles and so on, which is definitely following the more traditional gender roles. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. Definitely. Yeah, which I definitely find interesting because it's like Bauhaus shows us so like such a progression and a different style of living. Yeah, totally. I think we still see this today in politics or something. We can see a lot of female politicians after a while end up um, sacrificing their femininity Mm. um, that maybe they felt super comfortable in before but is now frowned upon and is seen as a weakness rather than a strength. Mm. And so a lot of uh, female artists at the Bauhaus also took a step away from their traditional gender roles and their specific way of dressing to, to... show a bit of strength or to sort of not show the weakness that they were told was found in their femininity, which is a real shame. But we can say what we want about, like, you know, this and that was difficult and on the Bauhaus, you know, they did this and that to women. But, I mean, these people, these women were so strong and ended up, I mean, think about when Bauhaus was basically ended by National Socialism in Germany. Um, the lucky few that could flee f- um, fled to America, and I'm, if mm. I'm not mistaken, it was three women that basically 
spread Bauhaus across the world and brought the ideals of Bauhaus to the U.S. and abroad. And um, this is why we still have sort of sub-movements kind of branching off Bauhaus today. Otherwise, there is a potential that it could have died or just stayed a German movement, you know, rather mm -hmm. than an international, you know, era. Yeah. era. Phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. Or like, for example, Lucia Maholinaj, the wife of um, Laszlo Maholinaj, um, it's crazy because all the pictures that we see of Bauhaus today, they were mostly taken by her. So she pretty much, she kind of gave Bauhaus a face, like her photography. And it's just kind of sad because I think later then she even had a lawsuit because everything was under the name of her husband. She was a learned photographer and um, Lazo Mohalinaj wasn't. Yeah. That must be so infuriating having and, your um, work done and then taken by the person you love doing it or by yeah, anybody but yeah. someone that you trust. But um, yeah, and, and pretty much as you said, Mia, is that like lots of women who wanted to actually do architecture or who wanted to, you know, work in the Metallwerkstatt or Bildhauerei, they were all just sent into the Weberei. Imagine you're really passionate in like <laughs> um, woodworks or something and you're told you can't do it just because of your gender and you're not strong enough or whatever yeah, the yeah. reason was you and get put in some workshop where you don't exactly and to think then oh i thought I, this was a different kind of school a school that looks at like things like this different and then to realize that they weren't so different especially mm -hmm. at the beginning must have been extremely yeah. difficult and extremely demotivating as well yeah. like yeah and apparently also like oscar schlemmer you know like just said wo wolle is is auch ein weib das webt und sei es nur zum zeitvertreib <laughs> it's just like very degrading mm -hmm. you know yeah, but I wonder if the Weberei was maybe like a safe space also for women at Bauhaus Definitely. because it was like mm. a only um, female workshop and they initially also kind of uh, taught themselves how to do it. It was like a, a self-taught subject where mm -hmm. they would like find um, how, how, to, how to do it through trial and error and maybe also creating a safe space for just them in like this school where they would just initially maybe be discriminated from the other workshops. For sure, they definitely revolutionized like the whole um, so textilkunst. Man sagt immer so, sie haben Weben neu erfunden because mm. uh, yeah. the way like uh, the patterns and like the the brave kind of like also color because it, it, it was from the form and Farblehre which was taught at Bauhaus and they kind of used these carpets as a canvas in a way. Yeah. And um, it was actually, you know, it wasn't actually seen as a Werkstatt. It was more seen as a Kunstgewerbe. And it was mm -hmm. like, it was always, you know, it was always put last, pretty much. And, and riddled as well. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is, yeah, exactly. And the funny thing is that was actually the most successful mm. workshop ever. Yeah, commercially of all. successful it workshop of the Bauhaus. the yeah. most, you know, and it was, but it was always, like, frowned upon. Mm. But, like, the work did pay off, you know, the women sure. who were, did have the most famous work that was or like one of the most famous works that was shown and I think that also you know says a lot and it was also the only Werkstatt which was then later also led by Gunther Stolze. Sie erhielt ja auch, um, also ich glaube sie verdiente weniger als ihre männlichen Kollegen mm -hmm. und sie erhielt auch nur immer einen befristeten Arbeitsvertrag deswegen konnte sie, sie keine wirklich feste Stelle sie war wirklich also Sie yeah. wurde wahrscheinlich immer wieder beurteilt und reevaluiert, ob sie da wirklich weiter bleiben konnte. Yeah, she also fought for equal pay and she won that battle. So she yeah. Uh, yeah. demanded yeah. to be paid the same as her her other male colleagues that were considered a Bauhausmeister. And it was long and tedious, but eventually she got paid the same as her male colleagues. And I think that that's mm. something that must have been so uncomfortable for her. And she received, you know, a lot of backlash, but she got what she would she wanted and deserved. It's such a clear, obvious thing to want the same pay as your other work, mm. like work even colleagues. Today, you know, it's, it's, still it's, an issue. Even, it's still an issue today. It just doesn't make any back, sense. But back <laughs> then, when everything was like growing with all the like women's rights movement, to really just stand up for yourself and really also get the result that you're after is really inspirational. Yeah. Yeah, I think since she was a mom and a wife at home. Es galt als Tabubruch, dass sie daneben immer noch wirklich wahrscheinlich für Vollzeit oder Teilzeit gearbeitet hat und ja alles noch in die Weberei gesteckt hat. Yeah, as if her work would uh, distract from her duty as a mother and that she would therefore be... And that would be a like, crime as a woman. Exactly, and that she wouldn't be oh. a good enough mother, she wouldn't be able to dedicate all of her time to her kids and her husband and that whole 
Mm. Yeah. The delusional idea. Like, really great for the Bauhaus and for her as well that she insisted on staying and like Definitely. continuing her work. I uh, didn't Paul Klee also say that women can't be genius. Genius is only a male Yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, precisely. So I love to know that I'm like stupid. Yeah. I love to know I'm yeah. dumb as shit. Also, also, <laughs> yeah, thank God I'm not stupid. Oh, Bruno, <laughs> yes. Luckily, we have one guy who's saving the podcast. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't be able one to do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, apparently, Johannes Itten also said, Frauen können nur zwei dimensional sehen und sollten daher besser in der Fläche arbeiten. Well, let's talk about this in It's terms like, of yes, like. Yes, I can't see 3D objects. No, I don't. <laughs> hey, I just what? see everything like a poster. <laughs> 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 no, but come on, let's consider the time that this was in. I'm not saying that this is okay, mm. but let's just kind of go back and think was this something that they knew was wrong and just wanted to, you know, promote the separation of genders or was it something that was just taught to them and they thought Definitely. was normal and this was just an, an accepted an accepted notion i think yeah. it was something so ingrained yeah. into just like the, the way it is today yeah, yeah. yeah like people still straight up think like oh yeah you know uh women women are less capable than men and this and that for sure definitely like also marianne brandt who obviously like you know she's like if you are going to talk about Frauen and Bauhaus, it's a name that like comes yeah. up the most. And she was so fascinated by what the Bauhaus was doing. And I think she, she quit her paint studies mm-hmm. and she left everything else behind her and she went yeah to Bauhaus. And, you know, Maholi Naj definitely helped her a lot because he wanted her to be successful in the whole metal workshop. And, you know, all these teapots that we see and the ashtray and everything, like, this was all her so i think she definitely she also revolutionized that workshop and also proved them like hey we can actually see in 3d oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah exactly and also like those were probably like the most iconic and most sold bauhaus yeah pieces pieces definitely. so um, yeah so apparently mariana brandt she was she was a leiterin of the metal Werkstatt, but only a stellvertretende leiterin um from 1928 to 1929 when naj stepped down um, and so she kind of like replaced him, but only until they found another man. So oh, okay. again, like technically she was a lighter, okay. but not really on the same level. Mm. Not really long term. Her yes. colleagues right. and stuff. Das konnte man auch ganz gut sehen in der Keramik um, Werkstatt im Bauhaus. Also von 1920 bis 1925 bestand uh, ungefähr 30 Kilometer von Weimar entfernt. Um, die, das Dorf, das hieß Dornburg um, und da war die keramische Werkstatt vom Bauhaus, also es war nicht in Weimar direkt, um, die sich auch als Bauhaus-Töpferei bezeichnete um, und die war nur in der Zeit, weil danach hat der Bauhaus sich so ein bisschen umgestellt und wurde ein bisschen technischer und dann gab es keine Keramikwerkstatt mehr. Nee, bis 1925 um, haben da sieben männliche und acht weibliche Lehrlinge gearbeitet, also tatsächlich mehr Frauen als Männer was eigentlich dann ein ziemlich ausgeglichenes Geschlechtsverhältnis war. Aber der Meister der Keramikwerkstatt, Gerhard Marx, ähm, sprach sich klar eigentlich gegen Frauen aus und dass er ein ziemlicher Sexist war, der sagte, also er möchte möglichst keine Frauen in die Töpferei aufnehmen, bereits Irit und der Werkstatt wegen. We wouldn't want to force anyone into something they really don't want to do. He's yeah. just yeah. saving them from what they love. <laughs> Even though they like applied for this. Yeah. <laughs> Und eine der be- äh, bedeutenden Namen in, von den Frauen, die in der Keramik gearbeitet haben, war Margarete Hemann. Aber der Meister, also Marx von der Keramikwerkstatt und sein Werkmeister Max Krehan haben Margarete Hemann das Leben sehr schwer gemacht in der Keramikwerkstatt. Und eventuell ist sie auch ähm, gegangen deswegen. Sie hat es frühzeitig abgebrochen und die haben sie halt ziemlich belästigt alleine aus dem Grund, dass sie eine Frau war. Sie wurde nämlich nach ihrer Probezeit in der Keramikwerkstatt in Dornburg bescheinigt. Sie sei zwar künstlerisch begabt, aber nicht für die Werkstatt geeignet. Ohne weitere Exp- Explanation dazu. <lacht> <lacht> und es gab auch eine andere ziemlich berühmte Frau, die in der Keramikwerkstatt gearbeitet hat, und zwar Margarete Freeländer. Mm, ja. Sie war von 1919 bis 25 da, also ganz vom Anfang, und gehört da zu, zu den vielen Frauen, die, die frühzeitig dann am Bauhaus gegangen sind und wurde die erste weibliche Töpfer. Meisterin in Deutschland, ähm, aber das oh, konnte sie oh. auch nur in Halle machen oh. und die Möglichkeit war nicht da für sie, das am Bauhaus zu machen in Weimar. Wir kennen auch eine Meisterin, so eine contemporary artist, who works with ceramics and makes a lot of different vessels and actually has a goal to make one million different vessels 
um, over her lifetime. She's a very good friend of ours. <laughs> her name is Uli Eichner, a Berlin-based artist from Austria. We love her. We love, love her. her. And we actually have the opportunity to ask her a few questions today because she's, you know, works in the Chaparai business. And she was kind enough to um, okay. send us back her answers about how it was for her as a woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She w yeah, she was just saying generally how, like, mm -hmm. um, what she calls Neue Medien, so um, new ways of making art uh, at that time were definitely uh, a female-dominated field, um, which to me is quite interesting um, how... If we relate this back to the Bauhaus uh, movement in the early 20s, um, how, you know, how a movement at the time that was so, um, so avant-garde and so new was actually dominated by men, but for its time was super inclusive. So it did have a lot of, I mean, for the time, had a lot of female influence and how, you know, 60 years later than when Uli was studying as well, that, you know, all the innovation, the new... Um, ways of making art were female dominated. I think that's also something that we can yeah. mm -hmm. touch on. Yeah, and an aspect that what she specified was that because it was the beginning of the digital era, that it was territory that no one had been a part of and no one had uh, done anything in the digital age. So it was an area where those gender roles didn't exist yet and so that women could come in mm -hmm. and define them before men. those yeah, gender yeah. roles were like reinstated in this new field, which I thought was super fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Should we read that quote? I think that's a really yeah, good yeah, quote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... Ich trage den Nam Namen Uli Eigner. Uli ist eigentlich ein Männername. Schon im ersten Semester an der Akademie begriff ich, dass es der Rezeption meiner Arbeit gut tut, wenn man nicht so genau wusste, dass der Name Uli Eigner für eine Frau und nicht für einen Mann steht. Bis heute werde ich immer wieder als Herr Uli Eigner angeschrieben. Ich korrigierte und korrigiere das nie. Ich yeah. thought that, as I read this, I was just convinced as well, or like, es hat mich so mehr in die Realität der Dinge nochmal geschoben, weil mm. um, oft ist ja das, die Default, also Gender Neutral, um, Version von einem Menschen wird einfach automatisch von Leuten als männlich angesehen mm -hmm, und yeah. das hat sich hier nochmal richtig wiedergespiegelt. Vor allem wird ihre Kunst bestimmt dadurch auch verschieden von als einer mm -hmm. anderen Perspektive beachtet, beachtet begutachtet. Ja. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And also that she doesn't correct anyone if they do think it's yeah. uh, men's work, which I think in my initial reaction was like, oh, like why would you do that? Don't you want to like be like, hey, no, I can do this amazing work as a woman? But I also understand that you kind of have to just I think it also has something to do with the fact that she doesn't want to push the conversation about her art into that mm -hmm. on, onto that topic. Because mm -hmm. once she starts with a dialogue like, hey, no, I'm a woman, people keep... Um, yeah. Like, you know, as soon as she would say more stuff like this, like she told us in the quote, um, the conversation would move from her art mm -hmm. to this, like, feminist... To point her of gender. View. Exactly, yeah. to her yeah. gender. And sh I don't think she wants to represent herself as her gender. That's she wants yeah. to represent her art um, gender neutral. Mm. Yeah. I think like, yeah, if that's If someone else says, like, hey, Uli, like, das ist auf jeden Fall männlich, then that's their mistake. And mm -hmm. I, th I think she's. For not being like in fine that she's. Order, yeah. Just, yeah, exactly. She's just letting them make their mistakes and she's just standing back and she's like, yeah, yeah. this is my art. Do that's what true. you want. It doesn't really matter. I think true success is also when, like, we're not even having this discussion anymore about. Exactly. female artists and female this and female that like it doesn't matter if we're all exactly. just that's like you know if we're all just artists and we're all just mm -hmm. doing our thing that's like when yeah you know it's just the art is the art it doesn't matter who's behind yeah. it you know? and it stops so. being about the artist but more about the yeah. art itself i think a really key distinction is that you can't the quality of the art is so good and so so connected to the individual that it's not connected to their gender it's not connected to their identity it's just connected to their creative expression yeah yeah mm think that's really really well said yeah 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 so thank you so much for listening um we hope you enjoyed this uh episode today and maybe learned a little bit more and the Bauhaus despite its flaws that every other school um also had but the one thing I think that must be said without um sort of you know taking away from the struggles of the female artists there is that it was a very progressive space and that there were for the time, a lot of new opportunities that women didn't experience anywhere else. And so it's something that now in this context we can look back on and be like, oh, this was right and this was wrong and we consider ourselves to be, you know, the judges of this. But I think it's, you know, I think it's important to reflect on this, you know, 
a hundred years ago, 101 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, how things have changed and what things have stayed sadly the, the same, you know, we yeah. still experience a gender wage gap across the world, but I mean, here in Germany, where we are right now, it's, there's a yeah. gender wage gap, which is surprisingly large for what people consider to be a pro- very progressive country. Yeah. I mean, there's also discrimination in every it's just, yeah, field. And I think just like educating ourselves and educating others Definitely. leads to a smarter, open-minded and aware, aware society. Exactly. And if we educate ourselves, we can continue to educate others who can then go and educate others. And it's a really nice ripple effect. Yeah, exactly. We hope. So if you um, want to check out our other podcast episodes, we are on YouTube, SoundCloud. You can also contact us through our blog um, at www.jungesbauhaus.de for more information. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.